Hi, uh, it's Janet Fitch, and it is Writing Wednesday, um, last, it's last Wednesday of the month. Um, I uh, wanted to take a moment uh, to say that through the Community of Writers, uh, communityofwriters.org, um, that, that uh, uh, Fiction First Aid uh, will be on uh, Friday, so I think they're aiming at the last Friday of the month. Uh, hi, Alden. So these are 15-minute um, consults, one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, experienced teachers, writers uh, who, I mean, who hasn't taught at the community of writers. So they have a really good lineup this, uh, this month, so Friday starting at 10, and going till three or four. Um, you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one with me, uh, Glenn David Gold, who wrote uh, Carter Beats the Devil, uh, Vanessa Hua, um, and, uh, 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 Leong uh, Chung, and, uh, Victoria Patterson, and I'm forgetting someone, but anyway, there are six of us. And uh, you take your, think about your question. Some of you have already done it. Some of the people who are attending right now have try, tried it last month. And uh, if you have something that's been bugging you, a story question, you know, your ending doesn't seem right, or how do I get out of this mess I've found myself in, or, you know, you can submit a page. So it's like, how's my writing going, you know? Do you see any problems in my actual prose? Um, dialogue problems? I mean, uh, so it's great um, because it the 15 minutes forces you to focus on what you're really having trouble with. Um, uh, if we don't have to formalize it as a question, you know, if we think we could just noodle it around, um, we don't necessarily get to the bottom of what's really been bugging us. Um, so the opportunity to have somebody really clear-sighted, really quick, um, hearing what you have to say and giving you some concrete information as opposed to just digging through books that give advice but not tailored to your problem. Um, this is a live human being uh, and excellent, excellent teachers as well as being uh, phenomenal writers uh, that you've actually heard of. Um, uh, so anyway, this is my um, pitch for that. It's on Facebook. It's on my, the author page. Uh, I'll share it on the author page. Uh, so signups are uh, going now and the slots are filling. So go ahead. Um, so I have a question um, today that I'm going to be working with. Uh, but if you have related questions or unrelated questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. Also, I'm, as you know, I'm preparing a, a group of classes for the community of writers um, into the fall and winter um, and trying to find out from you what specifically you would like, um, topics that you would like uh, uh, covered and whether you like a, a weekend workshop, a full week, you know, some people can't do a full week, I, I'd like to know, um, um, weekend intensive, you know, all day, all day, or um, a six week kind of setup. So uh, definitely just put them in comments, you know, I always read them. So today's topic is metaphor. Um, I have a uh, question from one of you for Brenda who is here um, and she says it, her subject is building a better metaphor um, I hope I'm not taking advantage no you're not Brenda it's awesome um, so you can always write to me uh, through my website and uh, um, happy to take questions for future uh, writing Wednesdays I, I like it best when it comes from you guys um, I'd love to hear your ideas on metaphor and simile, uh, and I just all call them metaphors, you know, what difference does it make? Um, when I'm writing madly, 
One thing that stops me cold is when I invariably use a tired phrase like cut from the same cloth, and yet I also fear overreaching and creating a metaphor that's too original. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. I recently had a character call a bureaucrat a paramecium in a particularly stagnant pool. It's pretty good. Uh, I thought it was fun, but the editor thought it was too rude and obscure. <laughs> Uh, I've jotted in my journal metaphors I find that I love I find that I love them but of course I can't use them they belong to another writer oh quotations from other writers and their metaphors mm -hmm. uh, so I'm left flailing around wondering how they ever came up with such brilliance um, any tricks tools exercises for improving metaphors and similes yes I absolutely have that first of all the difference between a metaphor and a simile. Now you're talking to somebody who is a history major. One of them has like, you know, like a butterfly on the move and one just says he was a butterfly on the move. One has like, one doesn't. Uh, and that's as, I could look it up, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, generally, it's stronger if you take out the like and just say he was a butterfly on the move. That's stronger. Um, but it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, I think that this editor, the thing about editors is they, they give you a, an impression, their impression, but ultimately it's your name on the story. So uh, in this case, I think, you know, if somebody is worried that a paramecium that people who would be likely to read this would stumble over what is a paramecium. Um, you can always bring it down a notch. You can always say a, you know, a one-celled animal in a stagnant pool um, or an amoeba or something a little more familiar if somebody is scared off by the long word. Um, but I think it's it's a funny and apt way of looking at somebody, and it also reveals character that they're seeing this guy through, kind of like a, a you know a microscope, a scientific uh, eye looking at something very very small. Um, so it it telescopes the the point of view, you know, right? You're looking at this guy um, from way back. Uh, so it's commenting on, you know, telling you something about the protagonist who's having this thought. Um, so I thought it was, it's clever um, and fun. She, uh, she mentions that the thing that stops you cold is that you inevitably use a tired phrase. And that's, I think, where we should begin to talk about metaphor first, is to talk about the cliche. What is a cliche? A cliche, most people, you could say a cliche is the mind's shorthand. Um, it's these little phrases that have become embedded in human consciousness, usually in a cult, one culture, in the culture's consciousness that snaps to mind because there's a fast mind and a slow mind. And the fast mind is the one that gets you away from the, the you know, lion that's chasing you, uh, you're not going to stop and go, you know, what's a better way to say this? <laughs> it's what snaps into mind. So a cliche is the mind's shorthand, but it's also, um, because it's been, you, it's language that's been handled a lot. It's a stand-in for something that is actually being experienced. It just pops into that slot. And as writers, we have to be aware that this is the mind's tendency. So it's not nothing wrong with you that you come up with cliches. Everybody does the first thing that comes because it just, it's automatic, which is its, its downside. It's automatic and people don't read for automatic language. People read for something fresh. They read you for a new insight, freshly minted language, just for the place in the book or the story that they're reading right now. 
It's the, it's the tailor-made suit as opposed to the one-size-fits-all situation that is a cliche, right? It it just people it just pops into mind. It fits in big as a house, small as a house. Blah 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 blah. Tells you nothing about the character. It is not delightful because it is. It's just a boilerplate. It just slams in there. The important thing as writers, uh, this is from my my writing teacher, Kate Braverman, uh, who was, uh, you know, oof. she was a mixed bag, but she was ferocious on the topic of the cliché. Um, that she said, anything that you have ever seen before, heard before, read before, is a cliché and cannot be used. Banned. Anything. Okay, now we're getting into the real work of writing. You know, so there's the cliche that automatically comes to mind, like we were talking about. Um, big as a house, small as a mouse, you know, white as snow, black as ink, blah, blah, blah. Um, so you can't use it, so you cross it out or you delete it um, because you know that that's a cliche. You've definitely seen that before. Hi, Chris. Um, then there, what'll come next after... Um, after the cliche that everybody thinks of, the family feud cliche, you know, 99% of all people will say that. Uh, then you go to a, something maybe Shakespeare said, something maybe Virginia Woolf said. And the thing about that is that too is a cliche because you have read it somewhere else. It is borrowed language. It is not fresh. You did not generate it. Um, and you're shirking your responsibility as a writer. This is where honesty comes in, where people talk about, you know, the honesty required of an artist, a real artist. You know that it's not. I mean, maybe 99 out of 100 people will not know that that's Virginia Woolf. But you know. And the honesty is to say, yeah, that's borrowed. I can't use that either. Maybe once in a 400-page novel, you can use somebody else's idea. One. <laughs> but in general, forget it. Um, so what you want is you'll come up with these cliches. You can't help it. But you have to be honest, rigorously honest with yourself cross that one out to delete it it's still not yours and then you sit there and you go how big was it how small was it um, you know you it takes a while you fight your way through you see a phenomenon and that's why I want you to use those notebooks you look at say this was something that happened to me when I was working to get over my you know, to get into the next level of writing, um, is I would drive around and I would see something or be out in the world seeing something and stop and describe it. You know, that's the, that's the practice of writing, right? Describe that. Then you stop and you go, what is it? The questions are, what is it? And then what is it really? So you get beyond the pop-up answer and really ask yourself, how do I describe that in original language? So you have, say, this this happened to me. Okay, I was driving down Wilshire Boulevard, which is sort of the main drag, one of the main drags in LA, and there were some very, very tall, slender palm trees in front of a building, a line of them. And they're all at an angle. And I pulled over and I sat there and I was going to describe those palm trees, say something about them. So of course the first, uh, the first, my first thing, my first try at it was, you know, they look like mops, you know, the shaggy heads, they look like mops. Um, have I ever heard that before? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's gone. Uh, then it's like, oh, they sort of look like Rod Stewart. 
you know, a Chaka Khan with a hair, right? That moppy hair. Had I ever heard that before? I had. I'd read it in the LA Weekly or some rock review or something about um, Rod Stewart, I think. Um, but I had heard it before that you have to put your feet to the fire and say, have I heard it before? Yes. That's gone too. Okay, now what the hell am I going to say about these palm trees? So I thought, okay, let's talk about how they're arranged, you know, the row, you know, that they're in. And what what's in rows? Soldiers. Okay, have you ever heard of that? Yeah, everything is arrayed like soldiers in a row, you know? So one of the ways you can get out of a cliche is by extending it, by being more specific. What kind of soldiers? You know, it's like the horse was round as an apple. Have you ever heard of round as an apple? Yes. But, you know, if you say, uh, or, you know, a, a, some woman, round as an apple, and you, you, you can write your way out of a cliche by being more specific. What kind of an apple? So, I would, I had said doing this as an exercise, you know, constant, constant, this is constant work. I said, you know, you could say she was round as an apple as a Granny Smith apple and twice as tart. So I've written my way out of a cliche. The cliche had begun, but what kind of an apple will take you out of it? What will tell you something specific? So you can start, you can write your way out of a cliche as well. So I'm looking at these soldiers ranged in front of this building and uh, the palm trees and, but they were all listing slightly to the side. And I got a very awkward description. This is not something, you know, I recommend I never used it, but uh, you know, it was like soldiers, drunken soldiers mustered out of bed in the middle of the night trying to find the vertical but they're all kind of looking at each other and they're all leaning slightly to one side and it wasn't good but that's the work of getting an original metaphor is you keep asking yourself well, what is it what is it really what is it really let's talk a little bit about people's prejudice against metaphor and i'm gonna you know, talk about this because we do have a um, almost, not universal, but a certain reluctance that people have about using metaphor. They feel that it's poetic language, that it's too, that's flowery. Uh, you see that a lot, you know, it's like, oh, it's too flowery. I can't use metaphor, you know, straight talk. But a, a good metaphor is so, it so catches the reader's attention and lets them clear, it, it gives them a clearer view of something than they would have had otherwise. And the metaphor is usually strained or um, colored by the point of view character. So it's not only language, but it's flavored by um, who is doing the seeing. So if you had a, uh, if you were describing, you know, some phenomenon in the world and what metaphor would a cook use? What metaphor would a plumber use? What metaphor would a um, breeder of horses use? I mean, they use a different vocabulary and they would have access to a different kind of store of, of vocab, you know, vocabulary and point of view. So you're always thinking, how would your character see this, not just how I would see it as a writer. Um, and uh, it, if you're in third person and you're writing more in your own voice, then you would see it in more in your own voice. But um, 
Uh, no, you do not want cliches in the way. You never want cliches. You want something original that will delight the reader. Um, you know, if you are, I mean, it's, it doesn't tell the reader anything new about the world to have a character say big as a house. You know, it just shows that your character is a, is a cliched thinker and who wants to spend a lot of time in that mind, you know, um, there's times where somebody would use it in dialogue, you know, um, but if the person, even if the person in dialogue can find a way to say it in a more interesting way, you know, um, you know, do so. But, you know, it, it generally in the dialogue, in somebody's utterance is probably, you can get away with it if you need to. But ask yourself, is there something more interesting you can do? It's not going to be a million dollar line. Oh, she was big in a house, I tell you, you know, it's like, yeah, okay. Uh, so what I do is, uh, so anyway, the idea is that, um, is it flowery? Well, not all metaphors are flowery, you know, metaphors are description and they, are their associational some association is made inside the character's mind to something else likening this to that and it it uh if people shy away from it thinking that it's flowery or f too feminine you know there's a gender problem here um but if you look at the best um uh, genre writers, the especially detectives, you know, the mystery genre, I mean, they are strong and incredible users of metaphor. If you read Chandler, I mean, his metaphors are the best, the best. And they tend to be in areas of hyperbole and understatement. So they're funny. Um, and I think I have a Chandler quote in here somewhere. Um, I, and there's just metaphor on metaphor, um, uh, or simile, whatever doesn't have the like, uh, his voice grew icicles. I should not have called you if it were not a Harvard boy. Nice use of the subjunctive. The end of my foot itched, but my bank account was still trying to crawl under a duck. So it's figurative language instead of saying I was broke. You know, my bank account was trying to crawl under a duck. He says stuff like this, you know, um, um, how loud, you ask yourself, how loud was that clock? A 69 cent alarm clock ticked on the peeling gray wall, the peeling gray white paint of the bureau. It ticked loud enough to shake the walls. So that's his overstatement. It's funny because, you know, it wasn't loud enough to shake the walls, but it was sure loud. Um, um, he, a 20 minute sleep, just a nice doze. In this time I had suffered, I had muffed a job and lost $8,000. Well, why not? In 20 minutes, you can sink a battleship down three or four planes, hold a double execution. You can die, get married, get fired, find a new job, have a tooth pulled, have your tonsils out. In 20 minutes, you can even get up in the morning. You can get a glass of water at a nightclub, maybe. You know, all of his stuff is going to be, is funny. Um, good verbs, but you want, you want to, like, here's a, here's a Chandlerism. I was dizzy as a dervish, as weak as a worn out washer. So he, he's going on alliteration, right? Dizzy as a dervish, weak as a worn out washer low as a badger's belly, as timid as a titmouse, and as unlikely to succeed as a ballet dancer with a wooden leg. So this is a question, you know, how, you know, how dizzy were you? How weak were you? How low were you? You know, and 
and answer these questions. I, 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 uh, it's one of the exercises people ask, you know, how do I work on metaphor? And I would just think to go with, okay, hot as blank, cold as blank, mean as blank, small as blank. It's from, I believe, uh, Farewell My Lovely. Uh, mean as blank, small as blank, dumb as blank, quiet as blank, big as blank, okay? So the first thing you do is give us the cliche, just so you can get it out of your head, you know? Hot as hell, you know, hot as a, you know, hot as hell. And then give us another hot. What else is hot? Um, you know, hot enough to fry an egg in a sidewalk. You could extend that metaphor, you know, hot enough to fry a blank, you know, an egg on the sidewalk and have time to, you know, what, just extend, you know, to extend the metaphor. But think of other things that are hot. So things that are hot, you know, what else is hot? Go ahead and write it up. Hot as what? What else is hot? How about the hot seat in a Senate hearing? How about what else is hot that could be on a hot seat in a Senate hearing? Uh, you know, like a, um, you know, a bottle of Chalupa, you know, on the hot seat of a Senate hearing, you know, in the, in August. I mean, you can, I mean, this is terrible because I'm thinking of it uh, on top of my head, but hot as jalapenos, keep going. Hot as jalapenos, you know, in what? In a hot, in a truck in, in August, um, you know, um, hot as an oven is there, you know, I'm not seeing any, anything that's delighting me in that. So think about the hot flash is interesting. Um, a door handle in Reading summer, hot as a pizza oven in a 12 o'clock Costco's. So th see what I mean? So these are ways to generate metaphor and whether or not you use them, you know, keep them and do this as a practice. And then by the time you need to come up with these things to describe something in your work, um, hot as a leather car seat in the middle of July, you know, the, the, um, it's a muscle that you need to start doing repetitions to gain strength. So when it's time to create this stuff in context, you have the muscle, you have the sense memory, you're, you know what to do, how to generate things. Uh, hot as, what else is hot? This is good, keep going. Um, Cause we're all hot, you know. Um, and then there's cold as, you know, cold as ice. The further apart, the more interesting the metaphor but cold as ice, cold as a witch's tit, I've heard, uh, you know, cold as, you know, as a glance from your ex with their new honey, or your new honey, um, you know, uh, cows has under branding iron, Death Valley pavement, mm-hmm, you know, hot as a stolen car in front of a police station, um, you know, all the things and all the ways that things can be hot, you know, um, and then, you know, cold as a handrail in winter mm -hmm. and a handrail in what's a cold state. You know, you add that in. Ah, hot as a Los Angeles late summer bra strap. 
metal handrail. Cold as a metal handrail in Alaska, December or February. Um, you know, really play with these. This is a fabulous exercise and, you know, get, you can get 15 good ones. Some of them are not, some, uh, good metaphors are not always literal in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, good metaphors are, not, the metaphors are not always physical. You can have um, abstract, you know, it was the blue of my father's suit when he last said goodbye. You know, um, it can be an abstract metaphor as well. Uh, I'll tell you, I used to um, work at, have it be in a cooperative nursery school. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but it's one of these places where um, parents work a day uh, at the nursery school, so they get it's a cheaper system because you're work you're donating your labor. So there could be like five parents and one teacher and twenty tiny kids, um, and you work one day a week. And I did this uh, for my daughter's nursery school. And one of my jobs, because they figured out I was a writer at that point, was to um, sit on the steps in the playhouse and get kids to talk to me and tell me stories. And uh, I would ask them questions, just kind of see where the you know the child's mind is right and little kids are generators if anybody has little kids these are wonderful things to do if you're stuck home. i mean if you're fortunate enough to be home with your kids right now <laughs> little kids and little kids are natural oh cold as the coffee in a bad diner swirling with rancid oil very good um so the idea is kids are natural, little tiny kids are natural generators of, um, of uh, there you go, get some, getting some hots and some colds in here. Um, the uh, little kids are gener natural generators of metaphor. So you ask, I was sitting there, would ask these little kids, and uh, uh, Chris was one of my uh, co nursery school parents, so he'll, he'll remember this. So I would ask these tiny kids, um, what's a star like? And got answer, it's like a flower without a stem. What's the moon like? I asked. It's like a smiling mouth. What is your shoe like? It's like a tiny boat. What's your nose like? It's like a tiny, tiny hill. What are my eyebrows like? Uh, they're like two bridges over two swimming pools. I mean, that's metaphor. That is great. I mean, it's mostly physical, mostly shape, you know, uh, defined by shape or color of an object. But that's pretty good. What something happens to us when we uh, turn about nine. If anybody has a little bit older kids, you'll this might ring a bell. Um, they become very conventional at nine, and they stop coming up with these imaginative answers to the questions. They um, things are like. If you ask them what things are like, they say they are like what they are because they know what they are now. Um, so what is this book like, you would ask? And they would say, it's like reading about something. It's a lot of words. So we're, we're losing the metaphor. Um, what's this TV like? It's a, like a movie screen that's close up. So they're not telling you what it's like anymore. They're telling you what it is. And this is what happens to human beings, is we become very unimaginative, flat-footed people at about nine. Um, what's this mirror like? It's a weird piece of glass, something that makes another of you. So you're getting an idea? It is what it is, is what happens. The imaginative quality is lost. Um, what's the moon like? 
It's a shining piece of something in the atmosphere, a big glowing thing in the sky. And isn't that sad? It's tragic. It's tragic. I mean, many of us who are turned out to be writers did not go down this path, and we kept the ability to make metaphor. But a lot of us did go through this. They call it the nine-year-old change. You know, we did go through this it is what it is thing. And now we're ready to reclaim our imaginative powers and the ability to make metaphor. So if you've tuned in, this probably applies to you. Uh, so Deanna says, I used to think the moon was a balloon that drifted too far and, and swallowed up a star. That's good. That's good. You know, that's a little kid. That's a tiny kid, usually, unless you're extremely imaginative. Um, so this is, uh, you can recapture, and adults need to do this. We all need to do this, even if we never really totally lost it. You know, we need to recapture our ability to imagine a metaphor. But unlike the little kid, we can use abstract things and ideas as well as shapes and colors. Um, but you have to challenge yourself to do it. So what is a mirror like? Uh, this, these are my working at it myself uh, when I first was recovering my ability to make metaphor. What is the mirror like? It's like a window I don't know uh, into what I don't know about myself. So I'm starting to think, what is a mirror? But you have to stop and do the work. You can't just do it when you're writing your story, you're trying to build a house and wait a second, I need to do some bodybuilding here. No, you need to do the bodybuilding all the time. Keep it going so that when you're building the house, you've got the muscle to to do this. Um, and notice the like, the simile metaphor issue. It's like a window into what I don't know about myself, or you can say it's a window into what I don't know about myself. You see, if you take out the like, it becomes even more emphatic. I like that. Stronger. What is my shoe like? It's like an older woman who's kept her figure and dyes her hair red. You can see those shoes. Uh, it's an older woman who's kept her figure and dyes her hair red. Uh, that was a pair of all of kind of uh, uh, high red high heels that I'd had. Um, so here are some exercises um, that you might want to do while you're pandemicing and sitting around wishing you could go out. What is the moon like? Or what is the moon? What's a cat like? What is trash in the street like? Um, what is, and pick somebody's voice. I use Dylan Thomas because he has such a beautiful voice. What is Dylan Thomas's voice like? What is your mother's voice like when she's mad at you? That was something I used with high school students. Um, there is um, an extended metaphor, oh, I don't have it at my fingertips today. Uh, but if I do a class on the sentence, I would do probably half a day on metaphor or even a full day on metaphor. Um, so the idea is to t you can take a form like that, that Chandler one that was so funny. Um, and you can fill in your own language. So I felt as blank as blank. I was as blank as blank. Uh, her house was as blank as a blank. The roof as the steps as and so on. And see if you can start generating some interesting metaphors. There's also the cliche uh, the cliche problem uh, is um, it's an indicator of writing that has not been really thought through. If you see it in your reading, if you start to see hot as hell, cold as night, you know, 
uh, cold as ice, uh, white as snow, um, hot as hell, you know, these cliches. If you're seeing them in something that you're reading, immediately close that book and throw it in the trash because you are working harder than that writer is. That is a writer who is not writing. They're not bringing the best of themselves to their work. They're not trying to create something new on the page. Uh, it's almost a, um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's a pregnancy test for bad writing. <laughs> when you see that kind of, of cliched metaphor uh, in, in there. Um, so you want to get rid of not only, you know, we're talking about the cliche, not only the metaphor that you just think about, you have to think of the met of the cliche first and get, and then get rid of it. That's very, very helpful rather than trying to suppress it. You just hot as hell, cold as night, blah, blah, blah. And then cross it out and go, how cold was it? How hot was it? You know, until you get to some, you'll get to some very interesting things and it'll give you a hint that when you're starting to look at your work and often it's not uh, when you're when you're writing, it's often later drafts where you really start creating interesting language. Um, you go back and as you're reading your last draft, you go, you know, circle everything that's a cliche, everything you've heard before, ever. And that means also um, uh, adjective noun pairs that you've seen before, golden sunset, you know. I never want to see a golden sunset, ever, you know. Uh, the hardest things to describe are things that are the beautiful things that have been described a million times. You have to find a fresh way to describe them. Uh, read Virginia Woolf's The Waves and the way she describes uh, the ocean. Um, to find that fresh language is just the strength of that writing. Oh my God. And she didn't come up with it the first time. She sat there and thought, what is it? What is it really? What is it really? Um, so no blood curdling screams. You've heard it before, no trembling hands, no cold sweat, cold shoulder, all that stuff, you know. That is all cliche and is banned. It's banned, you know. That's what gets your, when you submit work to an agent or an editor and they see that kind of writing, they'll, that's it. That's it for you. No matter how good a story it is, that'll be it for you. You're dead in the water already. Uh, writing is a, a, you know, is a very demand, it's a demanding form and everybody can write a sentence. Everybody can tell a story, sort of, you know. Um, but writing is something that has to do with the use of words and uh, awareness of what's been done before, what it, what has no juice, you know. It's like, um, golden sunset it's it's like a a coin that's been handled too much there's very little image left on that uh and it takes a while to find something more you know anything we've seen before the novel was as thick as a telephone book anybody ever heard that before yeah so you sit and think how thick was it what city's telephone book maybe will help you know, but also what else is thick? You know, I, I often, I mean, that's a problem that every one of us is going to have to face, is dimensionality, size of things, to give a, a way of saying what size something is without using a cliche and without saying it was approximately 26 inches in diameter, you know, which isn't as clear as saying, you know, it's about the size, you know, uh, how big was her hat? It was the size of a hula hoop. You know, the wonderful exaggeration. Um, you know, it was about the size of a hubcap. It was about the size of the lid of garbage can. It was about the size of a, co you know, coffee can, whatever. 
but the metaphor will give you the it's one of those things that a uh, makes the reader um, smile a good metaphor is like ah oh. you know it's like getting the the it's like getting the uh, the chocolate covered um, coffee beans in the in the ice cream getting the little bits of toffee the little crunchy pieces um, you know that they'll keep reading for those little crunchy pieces um, oh this is interesting Joe Beth says Patricia Smith who is an incredible poet one of the best living poets uh, has an exercise where you write a love poem without using a long list of words commonly used to describe love oh well, that'd be interesting I'd love to see the list of words that's cool um, but always anything you've seen before is banned um, my daughter is a backpacker hiker wilderness person and she went on a backpacking trip in uh, Utah and this group climbed to the top of uh, something called Green Mesa you know one of these astounding uh, vistas of you know mesas and canyons and and somebody looks out and goes there are no words to describe this and my daughter was like oh yes there are <laughs> you just don't have them <laughs> because you can't describe a view like that until you unless you've done all of these all of this muscle work all of that repetition all of that learning to look at a have a metaphor looking at a try to describe bamboo you know before you can describe the grand canyon you need to be able to create metaphor to see to give a picture of something in figurative language you have to train that muscle uh, and so i i cannot you know, a writer's job is to think of a new way of seeing things. And once you've, a good metaphor will change somebody's life. They will look at the world differently because they have read your work and they have seen something that, that was kind of blurry to them before. And you have given them an image that is so clear and bright. It's like, wow, there's a world. It's like putting on glasses. It's like, wow, there's a world out there. That I never saw very clearly before. Hardest things to describe: beautiful, a beautiful sunset, a beautiful woman or man, usually woman, and find fresh language for that. Um, you know, that's a wonderful challenge. Um, what else can I suggest? Um, Good nature writing often has a god. I've been reading John Burroughs, the naturalist, and he has the most beautiful, eye opening metaphors for uh, natural phenomena storms and streams and birds. And uh, most of the good nature writers, um, Kerouac is a wonderful nature writer if you read even. You know something like dharma bums and you know rather than being impressed by the beat you know by the beat all night parties and and um, sexual encounters and stuff you know hang in for the nature writing um you know he's spectacular and metaphors are wonderful there um chandler read read farewell my lovely it's uh you know any chandler uh his metaphors and they're always understatement overstatement you know the clock ticked loud enough to shake the walls uh, <laughs> how loud was it how soft was it not just you know quite as a mouse but how quiet was it you know what could you hear that was so quiet you know um i mean the delight of reading is often in this figure of language what else let me go back and look at your questions um new ways to describe palm trees jill said yeah sit there look at them 
Don't try to do this. Don't dry lab this stuff. You know, look at palm trees. I can see one outside my window right now. And think of 20 ways of describing that. You know, you can describe shape. You can describe um, any aspect of it. The fan-shaped leaf, the dryness, the... Um, the, the way, the method of growth outside the central stem, the braidedness of the, of the trunk, and find a metaphor to help us see it more clearly. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, but the, definitely the... Uh, there is a game of smoke. That's a really fun thing to do that will help with metaphor um, and description in general, which is a way of, it's a game, the game of smoke. It's sort of like 20, 20 questions, but what you do is you pick a, a figure uh, that the other per person would probably know. And it's, uh, it's a surrealist game. The surrealists were fabulous on games. And, um, you say if they were a if this person was a smoke, what kind of smoke would they be? Yeah. And then you think about whoever you're thinking about, and you think, God, what kind of a smoke would they be? Candle wax, um, dumpster fire, uh, cherry tobacco, pipe tobacco, uh, exhaust from a you know, 69 beetle, um, uh, incense, what kind of incense? And then it's like, can you, you know, in the language of architecture, what kind of, what kind of building would they be? You know, in the language of plants and animals, what kind of plant would this person be? Are they an oak? Are they a poplar? Are they a weeping willow? Are they a strangler fig? I and mean, then that'll give you basis also of metaphors. Uh, usually they can guess it, you know, what kind of a car would they be? What kind of a, what kind of a, what kind of, mu what kind of a musical instrument would they be? Uh, what kind of clothing would they be? And it gives you some you know, again, some way of triangulating uh, what you know with another aspect. Um, let's see. I like all your hot, hot as, cold as, mean as, uh, small as, dumb as, big as, you know, big, small, quiet, loud, uh, dumb, smart. How smart were they? I mean, that kid was so smart. How smart were they? You know, smart as a whip. Okay. But you can either extend that metaphor or and other things that are smart. You know, smart as a, as a new hat. It's better than smart as a whip. Um, Let's see, other questions that you had about this. I love hot as a hot flash, that was awesome. Um, so somebody was attacked by a, a pack of hungry hyenas when she was attacked by a violent object of a mob. Mm. I have heard the hyena metaphor, you know, um, and you know, I think that one takes a lot of work, you know, what would be original here for the violent object of a mob. It need, definitely needs a, uh, a metaphor. Um, Using cliches, maybe a minor character who you want to show is particularly dull in their language. Yeah, but it's like, it's not going to get you much. 
because it's something we've seen before. So yeah, you, you know, you can use it. Um, you know, your mother-in-law di dissing somebody you actually like, oh, she's big as it, you know, backside like a bus, you know? It's like, can you just stop talking? You know, I could see that, you could use it, but too much of it will really make your, make your reader crazy. Um, and here's one saying the cliches are the way the person thinks and reveal character and still be a great story, thinking of Catcher in the Rye. I should go through Catcher in the Rye and see how much real cliche is in there. I bet there's not much. Um, you know, that is an original thinker. That kid is an original thinker. Um, so it would be interesting to see how he uses what, you know, see if he does use cliche and how much of it. Um, and why it's not, why it doesn't drive you crazy. Um, out of the fire into a frying, out of the frying pan into the fire uh, is overused but necessary. Um, well, you have to figure out what does it mean, you know, to go from something bad to something even worse, trying to escape the bad thing and ending up in the thing that's worse. So you can certainly find something similar to that. Um, yeah, this is what we all do. We write out of the frying pan into the fire and then you circle it and you go, now how can I say this in an original way? Um, let's see what else I can answer. Okay. Any cool, any more questions or ideas about how to handle your um, Yeah, there's the you know, getting the Deanna's talking about having been a writer from the time she was uh young. I can't see the the longer it's not scrolling, it's just popping something up. Um, here we go. But she gets discouraged. Yeah, we all get discouraged, that's for sure. Um, the world is oversaturated with bad writing. Um, here we go. Yes. Uh, about having all the characters and things that you want to get out on paper and then feel discouraged that everyone's a writer. Everybody is not a writer. Every, many, many people are enjoying getting their thoughts out in blogs and so forth. But when we're talking about writing, when we're talking about challenging ourselves to rise above cliche, not only to tell a story, but to tell a story, to write that story, so that the language itself is, is um, a source of delight to the reader. Um, that's when you're a writer. That's the writing part. Uh, otherwise, there's a, a joke, you know, that's not writing, that's typing. Um, and, but you remind us that everyone who writes is not a writer. Yeah, sorry, that's true. It's just, it's not how your brain works, it's how much knowledge you can bring to the art form that you have chosen. You know, my kid would paint rainbows over pumpkins. That was her favorite thing to paint. But just because she painted didn't make her a painter. She didn't have, you know, she's four years old. She didn't have the capacity. Uh, she didn't know anything about it. She was expressing herself, which is a good thing. But, you know, you need to express yourself. You have to have something to express, things that you want to express. And then acquiring the skills and tools, as you're doing right now, to express them in an artistic way. Um, so it's who you are in your heart, and it's taking, getting the craft to support that. 
Uh, so it's both. It's both. And some people have the craft and don't have anything to say, you know. Uh, so it's getting down and knowing what you need to be writing about and talking about and what what is what is kind of electri electrifying you internally and then finding language and knowing how to put together all these different kinds of craft you know scene story language senses you know and how to handle all that which takes practice um yeah bad writing and there was a lot of bad writing it was not just this era believe me there were, there's always been bad writing um but we, we don't strive to be bad you know we strive to be good and people who who think oh well this bestseller doesn't do this it's like yeah well that's true you know but do you want to uh, do you want to aspire to that you know maybe not uh yeah take a look shona take a look at at catcher in the rye um and see really how that's put together uh how often would you suggest using a metaphor? That is something I should have should definitely say. It gets sometimes it gets to be too much. The people who are really averse to metaphorical, who think it's too flowery, um, your metaphors don't have to be flowery. They can be very hard hitting and or funny. And then how many funny lines do you need? The more the merrier, I would say, read Chandler and see, you know, that's, I mean, he'll have a good metaphor, like at least one or two in a, every paragraph. Um, but two in a sentence, no. Two in two consecutive sentences, no. You do want to have a balance between, um, you can have descriptive writing, but when you, are doing a good metaphor will will hold somebody for a couple of sentences at least if not a paragraph so yes more on that level you know maybe five percent um, of the sentences your expressions make the <laughs> Pam says your expressions make the class you can see that I know poker player <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> All righty. Well, that's a good one. So any other questions? So yeah, go this week. Go and just how big, you know, big is something, small is something, you know, quiet is something, loud is something, colors, you know, no lipstick, red. We've seen it. Fire engine red. We've seen it. You know, we did that thing with the paint chips and thought of new colors, more interesting colors. Uh, what would you say about coming up with a good metaphor that doesn't serve the story? Um, serving the story has to do with propulsion. So it doesn't have to serve the story, but what it needs to do is unlock the protagonist's um, point of view about things. So if there, we've talked before about how uh, somebody that you can describe a, say a person from the point of view of somebody who likes them and the point of view of somebody who doesn't like them and you get the same person you're describing the same person, but you get two separate sets of vocabulary to describe them because it's all about the spin. So a good metaphor will tell you the spin of the protagonist. Um, you know, somebody who is um, uh, unhappy in a situation will describe it in a different with a different metaphor than somebody who is very happy to be in that situation uh, so it doesn't have to serve the story it has to serve the, us understanding the character's point the character is making a point about what they're seeing by the way 
they describe things. So a metaphor, or tell us about themselves. You know, a, a baker will have a different metaphor about um, somebody's expression, you know, like a half-baked piece of sour, you know, a half-baked sourdough loaf versus what a plumber would say about them, like something, you know, you drag out of a clogged drain. Uh, a scientist would have the paramecium in a stagnant pool. So the metaphor tell is like a mirror of the character. You know, a dreamy character looks at the moon and has one kind of a metaphor about it. Um, a um, bitter middle-aged person will look at that moon and have a different metaphor. So it tells you about the mood, it tells you about the about the point of view character. All right, well thank you very much and have a good week and Fiction First Aid on Friday. So uh, you have to sign up before Friday if you want to do it. So it's communityofwriters.org, um, uh, Fiction First Aid, uh, Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning, 15 minute sessions. And think about, you know, any kind of urgent writing questions, that's a great place to go with it. So thank you and we'll see you next week.